Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. This is part two in our series of videos on descriptive statistics, and we're going to be talking about measures of variability, also known as measures of spread. So as kind of a thought experiment, what first comes into your mind when I mention a dog? You know, kind of think about what is the average or the typical dog? Well, you know, you might have something like this in your mind. Obviously, these are all puppies uh, shot from funny angles, right? But these are all dogs, uh, but they're all very different from each other, right? So you might have some notion of what the typical dog is, but we have to expect that the, the spectrum of dog, right, covers everything from this, this golden retriever puppy over here to this Tibetan mastiff over here, right? There's a huge variability when it comes to dogs. And this is, I mean, obviously a silly example, but this is kind of why we're interested in measures of variability. And can we get things that tell us about how different our data in a sample really are? So, you know, measures of central tendency, as we talked about in the previous video, locate the middle of a distribution in different ways, right? In the case of the median, it separates the top uh, number of scores from the bottom number of scores. In the case of the mean, it separates the mass of scores into two equal parts. And we talked about some of the virtues of those two different types of measurement in the previous video. But measures of spread or measures of variability are interested in how scores are distributed around that center point, right? And so is our, is our data, are our data characterized by high variability or low variability? So in this example, we're looking at a hypothetical data from rats where we're looking at the number of attempts it took them before they could kind of run a maze correctly and accurately. And in one case, we have relatively low variability, right, where the median score was a six, but the, the scores only ranged from four to eight. Whereas in the other example, the median score was a six, but the scores ranged from one to 11. So in both cases, the median is the same. The, the mean, I think, is also similar, if not the same in both of these cases. Uh, so the measures of central tendency don't tell us the whole story. And we need a measure of variability to really explain, hey, this is the center, but it's not all that variable versus in this case, this is the center, but you should keep in mind that there were some huge differences in performance here. So we have different ways of measuring variability and much like our different measures of central tendency, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, one of the most uh, common ones that you're probably familiar with is the range where we just look at the difference between the minimum score and the maximum score. Uh, 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 that's useful because it tells us about the total spread of the data but it doesn't really tell us about how data are kind of clustered within that range. And is everything spread out uniformly or is there kind of a greater density of scores around a certain point? Going another level deeper, we could calculate what's known as the interquartile range. And we'll talk about quartiles in more detail. But in brief, this separates the, the middle or the, the lower 25th percentile from the upper 75th percentile to tell us about the middle 50% of the data. And then we have uh, the sum of squared errors, the variance and the standard deviation which are a little bit complicated to explain, you know, without kind of walking through their, them step by step. But all I'm going to say for now, before we get into them later, is that all three of these measures are related and that after calculating the sum of squared errors, it's easy to calculate the variance. And after calculating the variance, it's easy to calculate the standard deviation. Okay, so again, why is variability important? You know, my dog example aside. Well, as a starting point, variability is really important when it comes to inference. And we're trying to generalize back from our sample to the larger population, because variability is going to affect the reliability of our estimators. So let's consider two groups, right? So we have a high variability sample and then a low variability sample. So both of these groups have a mean uh, of 100 if we consider all of the individuals here. But if I'm sampling from these groups, right, indicated by the bolded individuals, I'll get very different means. So look at the, I get an 87 and a 99 here. And then I get a 121, right, when I sample a different set of individuals and a 100.5 when I sample a different group of individuals over here. And then I get a you know, 111 versus a 99.5. So in the high variability group, if you look at the distribution of means, it's much more variable. Whereas in the low variability group, even though I'm sampling totally different people from one sample to the next, the distribution of means is really tight. So that means my ability to estimate the parameter, right, one, which is 100, is much more efficient right in this uh, in this low variability sample over here so variability is going to have an important influence on the reliability of our estimation and we want to try to you know kind of account for that variability or at least describe it so we know how much variability that we're dealing with 
Finally, variability is also really important for its own sake, right? So when it comes to things like manufacturing or, or sports, right, we might be really interested in consistency and trying to reduce variability and, you know, really try to get the exact same product being made over and over again or have exactly the same form for our free throw over and over again, right, so that we can have consistent performance. Alternatively, at times, we don't necessarily want to reduce variability, but we want to very accurately explain it. Right. So if we're talking about attitudes of a group, we don't want to just focus on what kind of the loudest person in the room is saying, but we want to make sure that we have an accurate description of what everyone says and believes. And in order to do that, we need to appropriately capture that variability. So this is why measures of variability are equally important as measures of central tendency in being able to describe what is happening in our sample, in addition to being used in our, the calculation of our inferential statistics. So again, kind of going back through these different measures of variability, we can start with the range, which is just the distance between the maximum score and the minimum score. One slightly uh, confusing additional term is that we'll often add this unit for error, right? Which tells us about the unit of measurement or the precision with which that measurement is taken. So to give you an example of how we might do that, if our X's are all, you know, 66.2, you know, 78.6 and so on, they all go to the first decimal. And assuming this isn't just you know, the convenience of rounding, but these are actually significant figures and we're, we're, we're taking it out to the last digit to which we have precision in our measurement, the error term for this would be 0.1 because we can measure something to within 0.1 accurately. Anything smaller than that, and we can't really measure it accurately. So you know, this, this may or may not actually be much of a factor depending on the type of data that you're working with, but you want to add on this unit for, for precision here at the end. So in this case, our maximum was 78.6 and our minimum was 62.7. So to calculate the full range, we would take the difference between those two numbers, add on the unit for precision, and we'd find that the range was 16. So this describes the total spread of the data. So the range is useful to know, but the minimum and the maximum aren't necessarily representative of all of the data that exist between them, right? In some cases, the maximum or the minimum could both be very extreme and unusual scores so the range might look huge but the actual data between those two extreme points might not be you know distributed that that uniformly so the sample range is not necessarily a statistic that we like in part because it really depends on n right or on the size of the sample and you can think about this because if i take a sample of for instance two people i'm much more likely to get one extreme score right and that's going to throw off my range and so with smaller n's, the range is pretty unstable. As n gets bigger and bigger, the range might be a better representation. Uh, and it's really most useful as kind of a population parameter, right? If we think about a, a theoretical range of values where we say, okay, everyone in the population is between these two values. If suddenly we find somebody who is outside of those values, then that becomes really surprising and interesting because we know you're basically bigger or smaller than the smallest person or the biggest person, right? Or you're, you're at some sort of extreme end of difference relative to the population. So a more informative statistic that we can calculate within the sample is the interquartile range. Uh, so quartiles are values of the X variable that, that divide the data into quarters. So if this is my X variable, right? And here are all of the different values of X down at the bottom. I have three quartiles, which is a little bit confusing. This is not the quartile, right? This is the quartile. The, the quartiles divide the data into quarters. So I have the first quarter and the second quarter, and those are separated by the first quartile. So that might sound a bit semantic, but it does actually become important as you think about kind of higher levels of division that you might want to use. Um, but basically, the first quartile is greater than the bottom quarter of the data. So it represents the 25th percentile. And the third quartile is greater than three quarters of the data, so it represents the 75th percentile. And therefore, the distance between these two quartiles is going to be 50% of the data, with the median right in the middle representing the second quartile. So the interquartile range in this case, right, is the distance between our first and third quartiles, and that would be a 6 minus a 3, which is 3. So 50% of our data are within you know, a three unit distance centered on the median. So the interquartile range can be really useful for describing the, the, um, the number of scores 
that are between you know the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. So again, much like we might use the median with a skewed distribution, the interquartile range is probably something that's gonna be really helpful if we're talking about skewed data as well. So the median and the interquartile range go together, but the next set of statistics that we're going to look at, which are the, the sum of squared errors and the standard deviation, tend to go with the mean. So thinking about the sum of squared errors, we talked about the mean last time and how it has a special relationship to individual errors. Right? And we said that because the mean puts an equal mass of scores above the mean as below the mean, that, that makes it so that the sum of total errors is equal to zero. But now we're not talking about the sum of errors, we're talking about the sum of squared errors. And let's think a little bit more about what that means. So again, an error is the deviation of each data point or datum from the mean. Right? So we would take each x minus the mean value, we would square each of those deviations and then add them up, in order to get these sum of squared errors. So in the population, the sum of squared errors would be the sum of each x observation minus the mean of the whole population. We would square each of those differences and then we would add each of those differences together to calculate the sum of squared errors. So if these dots are all of our individual x's, the mean of this is 115. We would take the difference uh, between each of these scores and the mean we would square each of those differences, right? And then we would add all of those differences together to get a sum of squared errors of 2,492. So the sum of squared errors does tell us about the total amount of variability in the data, but it's not really in units that are easy to understand. So we're, we're gonna want to do a little more work here to convert this into something a little bit more meaningful. But first, before we do that, think about the fact that you know these errors or the residuals are the difference between a score and the mean of the scores. So what then is a squared error and what does the sum of squared errors tell us? Take a second to think about your own answer, you know, pause the video, maybe write it down, and then go ahead and start the video again and we'll jump into this in more detail. Okay, so a squared error, right, is the difference between a score and the mean multiplied it by itself. That's what makes it squared. So in a literal sense, right, those are the squared errors. Now, more conceptually, the sum of squared errors tells us how much variability there is in a set of scores. So if it's some, all the scores tend to be closer to the mean, the sum of squared errors will be smaller, indicating the data are less variable. If they're farther from the mean, the sum of squared errors will be larger, indicating that the data are more variable. Now one of the downsides of the sum of squared errors is that there's no natural units to it. So if the sum of squared errors is 2,492, is that big or is that small? Well, it depends on how many scores there are, right? And it depends on the units of those scores. So we need to do a little bit more work on the sum of squared errors, but I do want to emphasize that the sum of squared errors is a useful concept in its own right because it gives us one measure of how variable the data are. And if we can reduce the, the sum of squared errors, then that means we've explained away some of the variance in the data. So it's gonna be a useful yardstick for us moving forward, but first let's talk about how we can get the sum of squared errors back into slightly more meaningful units. So recall that the sum of squared error, or the sum of errors, right, not squared errors, but the sum of errors around the mean is always gonna be equal to zero. So if I added up all of these individual errors that are shown here, the sum of all the individual errors is going to be equal to zero. Now we're talking about the sum of squared errors, which is often just shortened to sum of squares. Uh, so you'll hear people say that, but when they say sum of squares, it's just shorthand for the sum of squared errors. Uh, and conceptually, right, that means that we are squaring each of these observations. Now, squaring those observations is important because it's going to mean that there are no more negatives. So the positive values and the negative values aren't gonna cancel out. And now if we add all of those squared errors together, um, we will get some sort of total measure of variability. And one of the nice things about the mean here is that it will always produce the smallest sum of squared errors. For the same reason that the mean always produces a sum of errors that's equal to zero, the mean is always going to give us the smallest sum of squared errors because the mean tries to reduce the distance between itself and all of the data points. Right, so as a result of being pulled by all the data points, the mean is going to give us the smallest total sum of squared errors. Now, once we have that sum of squared errors, we can use it in the calculation of what's known as the variance. 
So this is probably the most sophisticated statistic for the calculation of variability, and it's going to be really important for us in all of our different calculations moving forward. And all the variance is, is the sum of squared errors divided by n, right? So this gives us the mean squared error, uh, which is the same as saying it's the average squared deviation. Okay, so the formula for the variance, denoted here as sigma squared, is just the sum of squared errors divided by the number of observations. So that tells us, on average, how far is a squared deviation, right? How far away from the mean is the average squared distance? So again, if these are our data points and there's a mean of 115, I'd take all of my squared deviations, I would add them together to get the sum of squared errors, and then I would divide by n, which in this case is 6, to get a measurement of 415. So the average squared deviation is 415.3. So that's really important to know. And like I said, the variance is going to be a very important statistic for us moving forward. But it's still not conceptually super sensical to say the average squared error was 415. So how can we solve that problem? The answer is that we can take the square root of it. But first, let's think about why we square that difference to begin with. Right? We could use absolute differences, like taking x minus the mean. This would be more intuitive and it would tell us about the average distance that scores are away from the mean. But squares have special mathematical properties and specifically squares allow us to break this variance into different parts. So for instance, if I want to describe the total sum of squared x's, I can actually mathematically separate that into the sum of squared errors here and the sum of the, of, uh, the mean value squared. So I have a squared measure of, of central tendency, which is common to all scores. And then I have a sum of squared errors, which represents the difference among scores. And you can't do this with the absolute value. And mathematically, this is going to be very important because what we're going to try to do with subsequent statistical tests is explain why some scores are different from the others. So in order to explain why individual scores are different, we need a measure of error that allows us to separate the common sources of variance from the unique sources of variance. And that conceptually is why we really like the sum of squared errors and we like the variance as a measure of variability because it's going to allow us to break these two pieces of variation apart. And then subsequently, we'll talk about how can we explain the sum of squared errors away. How can we explain individual differences in the data and say, well, this much variability is due to this factor and this much variability is due to this other factor? So when it actually comes to you know, explaining variability, we really like the variance. But when it comes to a descriptive statistic, we're probably actually going to prefer its little brother, which is the standard deviation. So like I said, right, if we talk about the mean squared deviation, that's hard to think about because we don't think in squared units. So what we can do is we can take the square root of the variance and that will give us the standard deviation. So conceptually, the standard deviation is just the typical difference between any score and the mean. And again, this is based on the sum of squared errors as a starting point. So to calculate the standard deviation, we're first going to calculate the variance uh, by taking the sum of squared errors and dividing it by n to get the average squared deviation. But in order to turn this into sigma for the standard deviation rather than sigma squared, what we have to do is take the square root of this quantity. And now we will have the standard deviation, which is the typical difference between any single score and the mean. So the variance right, is the average squared deviation. So taking the square root of the variance again then just gives us the standard deviation. So the value of the standard deviation over the variance is that now this is back in our original units, right? If our mean was in meters, now our standard deviation is in meters. If our mean was points on an IQ test, now our standard deviation is points on an IQ test. So converting from squared deviations back into the original units, the standard deviation is often much more interpretable as a statistic when we're describing things in a sample. So uh, if we want to think about this right as a calculation, let's say that this is our variable, uh, this is our random variable x, and here's all the different observations that we have. The first thing that we're going to need to do is calculate the mean, which in this case is 5. We can take the difference between each x value and the mean, so now we have an array of different scores here. We would then square all of those different scores to get the squared deviations, 
we can then at, uh, sum those deviations together, right? Or excuse me, we can then we can then sum those squared deviations together and divide those squared deviations by n to get the average squared deviation. So the variance here is 3.2. Now, if we want to go from the mean squared error to the root mean squared error, right? We take the square root, and now we have the standard deviation. So the average distance between any given score and the mean in this array of variables is 1.8. So the standard deviation is generally going to be a much more effective way of conveying what the average deviation was in our data. Again, we like the variance and the sum of squared errors for some of the things that they allow us to do statistically, but when it comes to describing what's happening in our sample, we're generally going to prefer calculating the standard deviation because it gives us a result that's in the same units as the original data.